India's market news headquarters. Cutting edge analysis. Influential insights. Market moving intelligence. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Thursday morning and uh, we're coming to you live as always from the CNBC TV 18 Mosley Rosewall Studios. Yesterday, the markets gave us a bit of a, uh, not a mini heart attack actually, it was not even that. The market pulled back quite a bit from the day's lowest point and overnight queues are rock solid. Very, very positive queues which we will detail here in just a bit from now. I'm Prashant with me, my colleagues Nigel and Reema. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, uh, good, good morning. Night. You know, we keep hearing that India is the only game in town. But look at the way the global markets have been rallying, right? Yeah. For the S&P 500, it's the 37th record of the year. Yeah. And we're just halfway through. Nikka is smashing new records. Well, that's right. Uh, but the Indian markets, you know, they continue to see buy on dips. And that's yeah. good news. Even yesterday, in the first half of trade, you would be fearing that we're going to finally see that correction that everyone's talking about, a couple of percentage points or... By the end of the day, everything, a big recovery on the broader markets in particular. Yeah. You know, though the headline index ended with a cut of around 100 points, but heartening to see the kind of buy on dips that's taking place. Absolutely, and I think that's the mantra. Yeah. Uh, buy every dip and uh, it's worked, uh, so why not? Well, you know, uh, so I think uh, just to begin where we left off yesterday at 3.30, so the Nifty basically failed to see a follow through from the previous day. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it also broke prior day lows. I mean, essentially the lows which the Nifty had been holding for the last several days, yesterday, the day's low, I mean, that went and it looked like perhaps, I mean, you'll see a meaningful, more deeper, meaningful pullback. But, well, uh, I don't think uh, that panned out and by close, things had recovered quite a bit. It's too early to judge if we are in for a bit of a pullback. And I think I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, upsides are clear because it's all blue sky because the market's all pretty much at all-time highs. Now it's essentially about a bit of defending. And uh, we'll come to the nifty levels in just a bit because across the board, you've got an important moving average which is emerging. But before I get to that, I'll just uh, sort of also wrap up the US market session where uh, it's basically new highs. The S&P 500 topped 5,600. It's a new sort of uh, high for the S&P 500, the benchmark index. Uh, you also had the NASDAQ. So S&P was up one, NASDAQ was up about 1.18% on your screens. You had uh, stocks like NVIDIA, Apple, some of the largest uh, mega caps in the US, which uh, outperformed the broader market. Uh, there was sort of individual stock-specific news flow there as well. But, uh, you know, these are the names which really did very, very well. Uh, as far as other, uh, you know, uh, other aspects of the market in the US, the 10-year yield, the bond yield was down a little bit, two basis points. Dollar index was down about 0 0.15. Oil prices creeped up about 0 0.8. It's not a bad-looking sort of picture out there because... Uh, you know, oil has been in this sort of uh, up and down, but not really going anywhere. And yields and dollar both are looking like they really want to come off, but they're not. I mean, for example, the dollar index has been skirting with that 105 levels, but not really breaking that support in a decisive kind of way. So we'll see. And I think uh, what may uh, sort of uh, help us towards doing that, maybe uh, tonight's US co uh, CPI number and markets will watch the core CPI. Uh, so it's the uh, expectations are up on your screen. Uh, once again, about 0.2% month-on-month growth, which translates to about 3.4% year-on-year growth. And I think this is uh, important uh, for uh, markets, for pricing, whether Fed rate cuts bring, are brought forward, whether, you know, uh, we'll have to wait a little longer. But I think that that is uh, the, uh, you know, in terms of data, perhaps the single most important one this week. Okay, let's uh, now talk about in, uh, the levels here. Uh, and I think, as I said, it's a bit of defending because upsides are, uh, we, 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 can, we, we head uh, where we want to go. But the 20-day emerges as an important support all on all, all indices for the Nifty, for the Bank Nifty, for the Mid-Cap Index, for the Small Cap Index. So the 20-day for the Nifty, Nifty is 23,887. Uh, and uh, we are not very far away from, the, uh, from, from that level. That, that, that must be defended in the short term uh, because, you know, a 20-day break has brought about 5-7% corrections in the market in the past, even an uptrending kind of market. So, you know, hopefully that is defended. Nifty Bank is now very close to its own 20-day moving average, which is 51,907. Again, very close, not even a few, a couple of percentage points away. Uh, the Nifty mid-cap actually broke the 20-day moving average yesterday at the day's lowest point and then pulled back from there. There was a 1% recovery. 
So it's tested that and pulled back. The 20-day uh, for the mid-cap index is 55,792. Uh, we left off at 56,921. And for the, the for the small cap index, uh, you know, we almost got to the 20-day, which is 18,404. Uh, and there we left off at 18,790. So a bit of defending uh, and, uh, you know, some stabilization as we head into earnings. And, you know, earnings, if you just read through earnings expectation, it's going to be a bit of a dull quarter. It's not... Uh, uh, there is an earnings slowdown, earnings growth slowdown, which is expected in Q1. We'll get numbers from TCS, Infosys tomorrow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm talking about the overall earnings basis. Uh, there is some uh, expectation that momentum will slow a little bit on that front. And of course, we're looking at the budget. Uh, say what you will, there is a lot of anticipation, and not anticipation, but actually a little bit of trepidation, uh, whether the government will do something on, on, on taxation for equities. Uh, so, you know, I think that's another hump to get over uh, at, 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 you know, in the very, very near uh, near term, we are the gift nifty is showing us a 60, 65 point higher start. Should you chase it uh, right at the word go? Uh, I don't think you should. I mean, it would have been much uh, better if you get a bit of a flattish start and then you get to play the upside because US markets, etc., are so uh, have closed so strong. But this is a 65 point higher start. So more defending than offensive, at least for me, as we begin another session. Prima. Well, talking about the U.S. market, I think there is one important statement from Jerome Powell which got the street excited yeah. because it basically opened the door for a Fed rate cut in September. He's talking about how that the Fed, yes, wants inflation to get back to 2%, but they're not fixated on the number 2%. They're looking at the trend. And this is what he says. You don't want to wait until inflation gets all the way down to 2% before cutting rates because if you wait that long, you've probably waited too long. There are risks which open up if you wait for too long. And that got the street excited. So, yes, they are focused on bringing down the inflation. They're on that path. But I guess the street interpretation is that we could see a Fed rate cut before inflation actually gets to that magic number of 2%. And economists are talking about as early as September. That's the U.S. market picture. Uh, it's just smashing records, right? Led by uh, the tech stocks. So yes, there is concern about too much concentration. But Nasdaq is up nearly 25% since the beginning of the year. The S&P 500 too, uh, clocking in a solid return. The picture across Asia is also very, very green. Uh, it's Nikkei today, which catches your attention because it surged to a fresh high crossing the 42,000 mark for the first time ever. But even the other Asia-Pacific uh, markets are higher on the back of you know, greater confidence about that Fed rate cut coming in the subsequent months and the rally that we had in U.S. Gift Nifty, we spoke about. That's a 60-point higher. For the day, we will watch for uh, TCS earnings. They come out post-market hours. The press conference is scheduled at 5.30, but we understand the results could come closer to about 3.45, uh, 4. Tomorrow, it's HCL Tech, and then Avenue Supermart on Saturday will um, you know, will be on our radar in terms of earnings for today and this week. Well, that's right. You know, and it's always good when you wake up to positive global cures. So that's a positive in itself. But you know, the big, three big triggers that I'm looking at for today, on the Nifty, it's the weekly expiry, the options expiry that will play out. So that's point number one. The second factor is we'll be having earnings, the one that already delivered a set of numbers to start like and I'll dwell a little bit more on that in just a bit. And the one we're looking forward to is TCS. So the tech earnings are going to be important. And post-market, when you're at home and chilling, you'll be looking out for the US uh, uh, CPI data that'll be coming out as well. And that'll be the mover from a global market perspective. So those are the three big triggers. What about the FIs? Well, on index futures yesterday, we saw a swing factor of close to 48,000 contracts because the longs were unbound by the FIs and shots were added. So that's why that swing factor of around 47, 48,000 contracts, odd, which... Uh, takes the short positioning now to around 20%. Remember, from around 15, it's gradually moved to around that 20% odd mark. And in absolute terms, you know, this is moving favorably, actually, because you don't want to see that uh, the FIs are net long to that extent. They almost went to around 4 lakh contracts, which is a record in itself. It's gradually coming down. So that's a positive, because now we're down to around 3.4 lakh contracts. I would like to see some more unwinding of uh, long positions. And you know, some shots in the system always helps the market. What about the clients? Well, there was some covering that they saw in yesterday's trading session. So we've been making this point that the clients that actually have been getting it right, well, they in fact were net short close to 3 lakh contracts. That's gradually come down to around 2.3 lakh contracts odd. So some reduction on the client short side and some reduction in the FI net long positions as well. So that's the positioning of both those two. What about the range? We're still in that broad range. You're close to around 500 points, 24,000, 24,500. That's the broad range. And in terms of reference levels, 
Well, in the last seven days or so, we have gone twice down to around the 24,150. So that becomes important, both those low points. And from both those two low points, we did see a bit of a bounce. The level you're looking at on the upside is the recent high, which is at around 24,444. The stock that I'm looking at is Tata Alexi. And it's going to be an interesting mover in today's trading session. Why do I say that? Because the largest vertical, that grew by close to around 5.3% on a cost, constant currency basis on a sequential basis. So that's encouraging. You know, that's the one that has more than 50% of its business and it led growth. The second factor is the adjusted EBIT. Well, that's actually improved. You know, X of the one-offs. So that's positive as well. And the one that everyone knows is that it's valuation-wise not very, very cheap. You have a tailwind of tech doing well overnight. There is some enthusiasm in the tech space here in India as well. And both those two, the growth is encouraging and the adjusted margin is quite good. So I think that could be the stock of the day. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Because transport has done very well, you should also watch for KPIT Tech. Because yes. KPIT Tech plays in the similar place, but it's a pure auto, um, you know, it caters to the entire auto space. So KPIT Tech and Tata Tech should be the two stocks you should watch on the back of uh, Tata LXC's numbers. But let's get to the equity calls then. Rajiv Batra of JP Morgan expects Q1 FI25 earnings to be driven by financial, auto and healthcare while dragged down by global cyclicals like oil and gas. He says in the near term, our sector allocation remains aligned largely with domestic cyclical plays amid positive earnings momentum, superior economic growth and policy continuity. He remains overweight on financials, auto, real estate, healthcare and industrials for the Q1 earnings season. He also sees two messages that are coming through. One, moderate top-line growth expectation and margin contraction of 24 basis points for the Nifty. All right, well, let's get you some uh, money market views now. This is Parul uh, Mithil Sinha of Standard Chartered Bank who says that the rupee has been completely range bound in a narrow range of between 83.43 to 83.53 to the dollar driven by lack of domestic triggers and stable USD. US CPI today could uh, likely provide some direction to USD INR pair and she expects the currency to remain range bound and trade between 83.4 to 83.65 to the dollar in the coming week. On the bonds, she says the Indian government bond yields were range-bound in the previous week due to lack of domestic triggers, while swaps moved lower in line with global rates. US CPI today and India CPI on Friday is likely to determine further moves in the rate market. The bond market is also closely watching the union budget on the 23rd of July and they expect the centre to stick to its stated fiscal consolidation path with FY25 fiscal deficit target of 5.1% of GDP. In the coming days, expect the 10-year benchmark yield to trade in a range of 6.95 to 7.05%. Well, uh, let's get to all the stock-specific action. Then we'll just highlight the top 10 lists that we're looking forward to. we get to that in further detail in just a bit. We're looking at Glenmark, Tata Alexi, JTL Industries, IRB Infra, PDC Industries, Shalbeam and Zydus Life. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow while we have Glenmark Life, Sula Vineyards and G Power that will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, Hartman Essel is Head of Equity and Credit uh, uh, APAC, Chief Investment Officer uh, at uh, WM UBS. He's uh, joining us now to take some questions. Uh, thanks very much uh, for joining us, uh, Hartman. Great to have you with us here. Prashant Desai. Uh, so describe the sort of environment for especially equities uh, uh, to us. I mean, I think the two best performing large markets in the world by far have been India and the U.S., uh, and and it's, there's been absolutely no stopping. And this is not just 2024 so far. It's been 2023. It's been 2022 as well. Uh, you know, do you think there is there is more room? S&P overnight topping 5,600. Large caps, mega caps doing very well. Uh, what's uh, what's your reading? Now, maybe starting with the U.S. first. Um, certainly, uh, a market that you know in its own right. I mean, you find all the the AI proxies there. You know, naturally, it's a very interesting one. We just do feel, you know, from a valuation point of view, you know, is that is that something that at these uh, current levels um, provides, you know, sort of unusually high upside, right? We think probably not so much, right? So, so we have a sort of neutral position, and we also think, you know, upcoming rate cuts, you know, inflation falling, all these things that were talked about before, is already to a large degree def uh, reflected in the valuation. Uh, India. Possibly a slightly uh, different story of India also, I would argue the, the, the earnings growth is a bit higher. So even though India is also from a valuation point of view, right, if you put it in the global context, not necessarily cheap, 
then again, I don't see a lot of reasons why it should, the valuation should come down to a large extent. And then you put in, you know, we think about 13% there about um, earnings growth. So yeah, um, India is probably interesting, but uh, we have markets in the region here in APEC, especially China and Korea, where we think we see even more upside, uh, that they, they are much more beaten down their laggards. Um, we think technically at least, these could, uh, you know, the next couple of months, this could be their time actually. Mm. But Hartman, what's the big call for global equities uh, for the next the second half of the year? The first half has been pretty good, right, across markets driven by this massive tech rally. In the second half, do you see enough triggers that this rally, this momentum continues? And what would they be? Yes, uh, certainly, as always, right, as an analyst, I will start with, with earnings. That looks pretty solid, uh, pretty much no matter where you look. Right, e either staying steady, like like um, India also remaining fairly high, right, or in other cases like UK is a market we particularly like in in Europe, right, where, where it even turns from negative to positive. We have an even better delta. The US is fine, so that works well. And then on top of it, where you have various central banks already starting to cut or have started to cut, uh, Fed we think will follow uh, as early as September. That's our call. Right, and then another one in December. So so also from that point of view, it's uh, supportive for valuations. However. We do think, you know, given what has already happened and to some extent the performance has baked that in, probably the asset class we even prefer is bonds, especially high-grade bonds. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we do see upside pretty much on, on, on most, pretty much every, but every of the large stock markets around the globe. Mm. Hi, Atmut, and uh, thanks a lot for joining in. This is Nigel on this side. I just want to clear the point on the Indian markets, you know, because we have been a rank out performer. We're giving earnings visibility as well. But how much is in the price? That's the big question, right, on valuations. So in the pecking order, where does India come? You briefly mentioned that you still like China as well as Korea. So does India come after both these two markets in the pecking order now at these valuations? Yeah, it's a very good point. Right? We think, and it's technically speaking, so we're talking six, maybe nine months. Um, India scores, I think, uh, quite reasonably well, right? But is it the market that is, has the potential to outperform uh, in the region here in APEC? And there... Both uh, China and also Korea probably more likely candidates, and it's not only because, of course, they're a lot cheaper than the valuation-wise than the Indian market, right? But that, that's oftentimes sort of a necessary, not necessarily a, a fully sufficient condition. Uh, but we do see, since a long time, we haven't seen upgrades in China. Now we do the last two months, right? And they're coming out of the internet space. Uh, we're seeing very tentative signs of life in the, in the property side, so especially in the secondary, uh, it's not so much looked at, right? But if you want to be sort of leading the curve, right? in, in, in China, we're seeing uh, the secondary markets already starting to recover. So it's just a matter of time that the primary markets probably also stabilize. Right? when these things happen, you have, you have um, upside both on earnings and on valuations. Right? So I'd say uh, comparing maybe Chinese market with Indian market, right? Both um, quite solid on, on earnings in our view, but but it, China has currently that, that upside potential on valuation that maybe India doesn't have to the same extent. Uh, you said that you see upside in most of uh, the global equity markets. Do you want to you know tell us how much more do you think we can run from here across the various markets, the ones you like, and even in India? Yeah. Say across the board, I mean, if you look at um, maybe say uh, 12 months, 12 months outlook, I'd say pretty much for most markets in, in line with earnings growth. So this can be 8 to 10 percent, say, on a, on a global scale. India or Asia in general, I should say, because Asia right now has um, higher earnings growth. And by the way, especially in the cyclicals. Right? So, so India is solid. But if you look at especially this year, it will be a, a Korea in particular. It will be a Taiwan and have even higher earnings growth. Now, you can argue what right, some of the cyclicals. So, so next year, maybe not quite as high. But nonetheless, right, we have these interesting markets here in the region. And a um, little bit of valuation support, as I mentioned, from, from beginning of, of rate cuts. So, yeah, you probably globally end up about 8 to 10 percent. India would argue could maybe even be a bit higher. Uh, but, but then again, Asia could also do quite well. So, um, yeah, a pretty solid story, I would say, around the globe. All right, uh, Hartmut, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us. It's uh, great speaking with you and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, as always. Uh, we'll take a quick commercial break here. A quick programming note. Uh, you know, uh, the question really is, uh, from a central banker perspective here in India, will the RBI cut rates this year? Is the RBI worried about a bubble in stock markets? Is India poised for a GDP upgrade? Uh, that's coming up uh, later in the day. A CNBC TV 18 mega exclusive, the definitive RBI governor interview. Uh, of course, you can watch it here on CNBC TV 18.
Welcome back. You're watching Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Thursday morning. Uh, the global queues are upbeat. The U.S. markets rallied over a percent. Asia is taking the cue from that, and you are seeing big moves. Uh, the Nikkei today has crossed that 42,000 mark for the first time ever. Hang Seng is up 1.5% nearly, and the Gift Nifty too is suggesting that after yesterday's little bit of weakness where the benchmark indices lost 100 points, we could recover and open up in the green. But it's time now to talk about individual stocks. This is CNBC TV 18's list of top stocks for the day. And Ekta joins in first up on Glenmark Life and Glenmark Pharma. Hi, Ekta. Good morning. Morning. Well, uh, you know, I expect Glenmark to be in the green because they are going to be selling stake in Glenmark Life. Uh, so Glenmark Fly La Pharma is going to be selling around 7.85% equity buyer and offer for sale in Glenmark Life. And with this, they will be exiting the residual stake that they have in Glenmark Life, which was their API business that they sold to Nirma Pharma uh, in September of 2023 at an enterprise value of around 7,500 odd crores or at a price of 615 rupees. Now, uh, this is going to be at, this OFS is going to be at a floor price of 810 rupees, which is a 7% discount to the CMP. And uh, the total worth at this 810 floor price is around 779 crores. With this, uh, Glenmark will entirely exit Glenmark Life, and that'll be the end of that particular story. But uh, nonetheless, it'll be positive for Glenmark for sure because they're going to get an influx of funds. It'll probably be used for uh, R&D as well as CapEx, as maybe any kind of residual debt reduction. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Tata LXC kick-started the tech earnings with the numbers yesterday post-market hours. The top-line growth was ahead of what the street was anticipating. The companies reported a revenue growth of 2.4% quarter-on-quarter, 8.4% on a year-on-year -year basis, and this is ahead of what the street was anticipating. Also in the call yesterday, they've guided that FY25 growth will be better than FY24, and FY24 was nearly a 9.5% growth, which basically means 10% perhaps for this year. EBIT margins appear to be lower on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, down by 150 basis points, but that's due to a one-off. If you strip that out, the adjusted EBITDA is, EBIT margins are up 60 basis points. The only concern when it comes for Tata LXC is the valuation because it trades at 48 times forward multiple. JP Morgan reiterates its underweight call. Their target price is at 5,700. Morgan Stanley, too, is underweight on the stock. They're saying high ask rates for the company to achieve FI25 growth to be better than FI24. Premium valuation, limited upside triggers keeps them underweight. So the street is concerned about valuations, but I'm going to go with green for Tata LXC. Uh, because we've seen that big Nasdaq rally, uh, you know, one and a half percent. There's generally a rub off flow through impact on Indian IT. And plus, revenues were a beat and adjusted margins too ticked up. And, mar you know, the decline in margins was a bit of a concern. So the fact that adjusted margins are up could be read as a positive. Okay, Rima. So that's the big one of the day, Tata Lexi. I'm looking at another company that came out with its set of numbers, which is JTL Industries. Now, the numbers on the top line, there was a growth of closure around two percent. But the encouraging part was the EBITDA did jump up by closure around 12 percent. On the top line, the growth is led by volumes because we know pricing was under pressure. But you look at it, well, on the margin front, there was some expansion on a year-in-year -year basis, which will be read possibly because the last quarter was a bit of a subdued one for the entire industry. Even on the EBITDA per ton, they're still clocking 4,600 rupees per ton. And the hope is that in the second half of the year, there's a recovery from year on. So the numbers are more or less in line with what Antique is working with, and it has valuation comfort as well. However, the two triggers that I'll be looking forward to in the time to come is, They've been talking about a QIP. Can they get enough demand for that? Because that's something that's been a lingering worry. Well, you know, there was a bit of a controversy with regard to one of their allotments. So can institutions come into the company? Point number one. Point number two is the promoters have taken warrants at 270 rupees. But at that point of time, things were looking up. So will they go ahead and convert the warrants? That's going to be important as well. So we'll keep an eye out on that stock. Well, Mangalam joins us to tell us about uh, Sula Vineyards that came out with their update. Uh, hey, Mangalam, morning. Good morning. So, you know, uh, we're used to seeing big numbers in terms of growth coming in from the Alcobev industry, particularly from Sula Vineyards as well. That wasn't the case to be in the first quarter. So the net revenue grew by just under 10%. In fact, their own brands grew, grew at a sluggish 2.7% and hospitality declined by 2.5%. But this is not to do with uh, Sula's own, uh, you know, uh, growth. It is actually the first quarter which was impacted by several dry days because of the election and also the scorching heat wave that reduced 
tourism. And that's something that we saw across the board in a lot of these, uh, you know, tourism related consumer companies as well. Uh, but going forward, there are a couple of triggers. They will begin bottling at one of their units in Maharashtra this month. And more importantly, they've made a big strategic announcement where they will transition both the economy and popular brands to a third party sales force in Maharashtra. They tried that in Karnataka and Telangana last year. That's done well for them. So the company's own sales force will focus exclusively on priority elite and premium brands. That's something that, you know, United Spirits did as well a couple of years ago. So this transition should help them. For starters, we expect the stock to open in the red largely because of the weak update that has come by. But it will be very interesting to see if that will be bought into or not. All right, uh, Mangalam, thanks very much uh, for that. So that's Sula in focus. More stocks with news flow. Vivek is here with that list. Vivek, morning. Well, good morning. You know, quite a few stocks on the radar. You know, first on the list is IRB Infra and the listed Invit as well. So what the IRB has done is it's given the operational update uh, for both the month of June in terms of total collection and also for Q1 FY25. So now when you're talking about June 2024 total collection, it's coming at 517 crore. That's almost a 35% rise compared to last year. What we need to keep in mind is that after June 2023, there have been three new tolling projects that have been added to their portfolio. Q1 FY25 revenues, again, higher by almost 31.5% and the company says that they anticipate the portal positive trend that started in Q1 to continue for the rest of the year as well. Uh, the second stock on the radar is GE Power India. Now, what's actually happened over here is that the company has gone ahead and done a slump sale of two of its businesses that contributed close to 36% of the total income for the year, for FY24. So the first business that they are selling to a related party uh, is the hydro business undertaking. It contributed a little over 31% of its total income in FY24. And this particular business is being sold at a total valuation of rupees one. Uh, th also, they are selling the gas power business uh, to G Renewable Energy, and this is for 43.8 crore. Uh, remember, this particular business contributed around five percent of the total income in FY24. Expect this particular stock to react negatively to this development. Uh, lastly, keep an eye out for PTC Industries. On Saturday, uh, the company is holding a board meeting to consider a fundraise and this particular fundraise could be via private placement, pref issue or the QIP route, whichever the board decides to go for. Thank you, Vivek, for that. Over to Ekta now for some more pharmaceutical stocks which are in the news. Ekta. Thanks for that. Well, Shalbi is going to be in focus because they've got a 30-year lease for Asha Parikh Hospital in Santa Cruz, Mumbai. They're going to be constructing a new healthcare facility of 175 beds. Uh, Zydis has got the approval for a heart failure drug in the US, Interesto Generic, and it's a large uh, market size for them. So that stock would be in, the fo in focus on account of that, possibly in the green on account of this news. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Ekta. Well, here's a quick recap of all the top stocks we're tracking. Let's go to the ones with positive news here first. Glenmark Pharma, you have Tata Alexi, JTL Industries, IRB, Infra, PTC Industries, Shalbeam, as well as Zydis Life. While on the flip side, you have three stocks that will be reacting to negative news flow, Glenmark Life, Sula, and GE Park. So that's about the equity markets, but uh, let's hop across to Manisha, who's joining us to tell us what's going on in the commodity markets. Hey, Manisha, good morning. Morning. Thank you for that, Nigel. I'll start with the crude oil prices, which have seen some gains come back. And this is because the U.S. inventories have declined by 3.4 million barrels in the previous week. This is the third straight week that we have seen a decline in crude, in gasoline and distillate stocks. So that tells you that the physical demand on ground in the U.S. seems to be doing well. The other thing is the report from OPEC and EIA suggesting that the global demand for crude is gaining not just this year, but is expected to gain in the next year as well. EIA has put a number of 104.7 million barrels per day, which is slightly lower than OPEC. But the point being that everybody does anticipate that next year as well, we could be looking at higher demand growth, and that clearly seems to be supporting prices. Uh, obviously, the strength in U.S. dollar index is what is keeping prices in check, not just for crude, but for metals also. So you have gold and silver prices trading kind of flat, but there is a definite decline that we've seen in copper for a third straight day. The China consumer prices rose less than expected, and the China producer in deflation is extended for a 21st month. Also, nickel is trading at 14-week lows, HRS steel prices at 18-month lows, so there is a pressure that's come back for metals. Okay, all right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. We'll take a quick break here. Deepan Mehta of Alexa Equities will be joining in with some specific stock talk. We'll also have Ravi Chavla, Managing Director and CEO at Gulf Oil Lubricants, uh, to discuss their business outlook and triggers from here. Stock's up 70% this year so far. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Even as India's investments into equities has surged in the past two years, supply of equity has matched demand, rupee for rupee. That's according to the latest report from Ashish Gupta, the CIO, Chief Investment Officer at Axis Mutual Fund. He says while about 5 trillion rupees has flowed into equities from mutual funds since April of 2022, secondary market sales by promoters PE since the same period, April of 2022, has been at 4.42 trillion. The report is titled Let's Talk Supply 2 and in that he details the amount of equity supplies that's hit the market. Uh, interesting, right? Both of them evenly match demand and supply. Absolutely. We all are very happy that uh, mutual fund SIP flows as well as uh, non-SIP flows, the equity part of uh, EPFO, pension, uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, insurance is all brought. Something like 5.5 5 trillion, he says. But 4.5 trillion has also gone out because of sales. And look at the table. Uh, let's pick up multinationals, promoters and, okay, first, uh, multinationals. Uh, they have sold about 12,000 crore in 23. 24, it went to 46,000, almost 47,000 crore. And 25... Just FY25, in the first quarter, it is 27,000 crore. And you remember all the uh, big names, Whirlpool, BAT, Hunda is coming, LG Mika, follow suit. Then let's look up the promoter sales. Promoter sales was 45,000 crore in FY23. Last year, 82,000. This year, just in one quarter, 30,000 crore. And we know all the big names. Remember, even TCS sold. Then there was Bharti, Indus, uh, you know, a whole lot of promoters, Polycab. And then the PE sales. PE sales, of course, 83,000 crore already in FY23. FY24, almost 80,000 crore. And FY25, just in the first quarter, nearly 36,000 crore. And again, all the big names. Bain moved out of Axis, you remember. Uh, then uh, BlackRock, if I remember right, moved out of uh, Embassy REIT. Then the, all those, uh, the Tiger Global, uh, uh, SoftBank moved out of all the e-commerce, Zomato, Paytm, Policy Bazaar. So that was a huge amount of PE money going out. Now, two major points that Ashish Gupta makes in the report. One, not much has gone for CapEx. See, 91 IPOs in the last 15 months uh, raised 80,000 crore. Of that, 61% was actually offered for sale. Promoters took away the money. Of the balance, about 40%, 25% was for deleveraging, working capital. 8% was uh, uh, increasing uh, capital by NBFCs to on-lend. And only 6% was for CapEx. I mean, not to worry, companies have even internal earnings, but just that the money raised is not going for CapEx. And finally, he says the equity deluge is not ending anytime soon. So uh, uh, next quarter, that is July of onwards, the IPOs are 3x what was raised by the IPOs in the first quarter in April, May, June. And actually, there is a number, oh, if you look at the rough prospectuses and already announced IPOs, it works out to 93,000 crores being taken out of the market in just the next few months. Uh, besides this, PE, private equities, uh, which hold stakes in listed companies and those which have already hit three years. You know, three-year vintage, normally they want to sell out uh, to give money back to their fund, uh, their contributors. That is 2.17 trillion, 2.17 lakh crore could go out. And this is only listed. Unlisted companies, they have some, you know, 4.6 trillion rupees, of which the three-year vintage is 3.67 trillion. And that can come via IPOs at some point in time. So the deluge is not getting over. Inflows are coming, but there are outflows lined up. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot, Lata, for joining in and detailing that note. Uh, appreciate it. Well, let's move on then. Let's talk about some of those stocks that we just discussed in the past segment in our top 10 segment. To help us out with some fundamental analysis, Deepan Mehta of Alexa Equities joins us on the show. Good morning, Deepan, and always good to see you in. I wanted to ask you about Tata Alexi. That's been a big outperformer. Valuation-wise, it's not cheap at all. You know, it's trading at close to around 7,000 rupees. But the numbers, there were some encouraging signs. The core business, which is that uh, core vertical, the transportation vertical, grew by more than 5% on a sequential basis. And adjusted margins actually did see a bit of an expansion. What's your view on the stock? Yeah, Nigel, good morning, and thank you for having me on your show. So first of all, a disclosure, Tata LXC is one of our core holdings, and it's not been an outperformer. Last three years, it has actually underperformed and dragged our overall returns down. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the results were pretty decent. And more than the results, I thought the management commentary was very positive. And uh, I haven't seen this kind of positivity in quite some while. Uh, they are looking at the uh, future with a great deal of expectation, new projects uh, expected to go on stream. And the healthcare 
which was a bit of a drag on the performance for last two, three quarters. There also, they expect that uh, things should start to reverse from this quarter onwards. And uh, the guidance that the margins will gradually move up, I think, is very positive. But the thing is that the stock is very richly valued. It's amongst the highest in terms of price to earnings multiple within its peer group. So I would say that uh, you know, upsides may be limited because of higher valuation. But at least uh, the numbers have come through much better than what I've seen last two, three quarters. So I would say that, like us, we are remaining invested, but I wouldn't advocate fresh buying. You know, uh, just talking about Tata LXE's underperformance versus peers, in the last three years, Tata LXE is up about 60-65%, while its peer, KPIT Tech, is up close to about 580-85%. So that's the extent of uh, underperformance. Yeah, that's right, Rima. You know, recent underperformance, five years though, the stock is up about 700%. Yeah. <laughs> so, so recently it's underperformed, last one year or so. But three otherwise, years now. Yeah, uh, three years now, Otherwise, actually. if you look at it a little longer, it depends on from where, when you're where looking at it. All right, um, Dipan, a quick word on uh, m and uh, That was a stock of the day, down close to about 7 odd percent. I was reading an Investec note where the management saying that they're in the process of launching a mid-cycle refresh for their product. And therefore, this, you know, the move that, you know, we've seen from them, uh, the cut in prices, it explains because the management wants to clear the inventory to make space for the newer models, the refreshed models. Um, you know, is this something that the street will accept? Uh, because the management has also come out and clarified that it's not linked to the UP hybrid tax, what we've seen. Um, how do you expect, you know, the stock to behave from here on after yesterday's fall? See, Rima, first a disclosure. So we are invested in the company. And one angle that you are forgetting over here is the monsoon. And the impetus which the government will give to the agriculture and rural sector. And which means that its second largest division, the farm equipment tractor division, should do exceptionally well or hopefully much better than last two, three years as the monsoon progresses. And that could be an earnings driver as well. Do keep in mind that the tractor division has higher operating profit margins than the automobile division per se. So marginal increases in tractor sales can immediately result in higher profits for m and And over there also, their premiumization trend is shaping up really well, where higher HP tractors and tractors with more features and higher profit margins, therefore, are in higher demand. So on the whole, I'm not bearish on m and at all. I think it's going to be amongst the best performing auto stocks. And these are just minor aberrations. Uh, you know, look at the latest offering in terms of uh, the EV, which they have got on the XUV 400. And I've done a test drive of XUV 400. It is a fantastic car and really the best in class and value for money over there. So uh, I think m and has really captured the imagination of the consumers. And uh, I don't think there's an issue in terms of uh, slowdown or any any kind of uh, gro uh, growth uh, you know issues in M and M. Very positive on the stock, but as I said, we are invested, so our views could be biased to that extent. Hmm. Okay, uh, Deepan, hi, morning. I'm going to come to you in a bit from now. Uh, we're going to talk about insurance, where there are price increases as we reported yesterday in the pain sector, where there is a small price increase. But I guess it is the direction, the signal which matters. Uh, you know, the, both items were our exclusives yesterday and it got both sectors pretty excited. Stocks ended at the high points of the day uh, in both pains and insurance as a space. But for now, we're going to talk about a specific company. Uh, Gulf Oil Lubricants is uh, what we're talking about. The stock's been buzzing. It's up 70% this year so far. You know, in comparison, the much larger peer, Castrol, is up some 40% uh, year to date. Uh, let's uh, talk about this with... Uh, uh, the uh, management, Mr. Ravi Chavla, is Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer at Gulf Oil uh, Lubricants. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for joining us. Great speaking with you. Prashant, this side. You know, I want to start with something which, uh, which, which uh, got the market's attention over the last couple of weeks. Maybe it actually has the market's attention for a while. It got our attention uh, lately, which is data centers, uh, Mr. Chavla. Uh, I think uh, you also have kind of, I mean, of course, this is in the future. You're also looking at launching new products, right? Specialty lubricants, etc. Specifically designed coolants, etc. Specifically designed for data centers. Could you talk to us a little bit about this? Is this a large opportunity or is the market kind of getting a little too excited unnecessarily? Well, Prashant, uh, thanks for having me. I think, uh, yeah, data center cooling... The market as we read it is not a very large market, but it is good for the environment. And uh, most of the lubricant companies can extend this because this is made from synthetic based stocks. 
some of it will be made uh, some of the product range will also be made from synthetic uh, base stocks paos what we call so this is if you look at the dc uh, market the data center market size it's about 1700 megawatts which is in 2025 expected to grow 20 percent right now people use air conditioners to charge to cool off these systems once these uh, this technology comes uh, it is going to start using uh, some of this data cooling, uh, but the the volume is very low. We anticipate it will only be 12 to 14 million liters if there's a 100% penetration, which is not going to happen because if you convert the 1700 megawatts into about 8.3 liters per uh, kilowatt, it's it's about 14 million liters. It's a very small size, but nonetheless, it's a good product to add on. And as data centers grow in India, of course, it will depend on how, how many of them adopt this new type of uh, cooling system. And uh, it is it is a small niche market, I would say, but uh, quite a good market in terms of the environment and all of us uh, will be a part of it. Hmm. So, uh, right, Mr. Chala, so you're saying that the market right now is about 1700 megawatt. It's of course uh, expected to grow rapidly, 20% uh, as you said. And is you is saying that if you use this coolant technology to, and convert all of the 1700 megawatt, it will be about 12 to 14 million liters. Of that's our assessment. That's our initial assessment. We have the product range already available all in our global portfolio. So it's a very small market. That's exactly what you said. I think it is. What okay. we anticipate. And, and just to put in put 12 to 14 million liters in uh, perspective, what is the overall volume uh, for the industry? Very, How much is so? Very low. Very low. It's 2.9 million tons. So this is not even uh, not even 0 0.001 percent. Uh, uh, volume. Okay. Two, volume. So, sorry. You said 12 to 14 million liters, and the overall yes. size is how much? 2.9 million tons. So it's you can do the math there. It's I was just oh. asking my team. It's, it's very, 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 small. Yeah. very, very. It's small. very, very. It's very, very small. Uh, got that. But you know, I, I was, I was uh, just, just talk to us a, a very basic thing. I mean, this is how does it work? I mean, you know, a lot of people can't make the connection between data centers and coolants. I mean, you're saying that right now so it's all centers, air conditioning. Yeah. So data yeah, centers. So you, yeah. yeah is basically the air conditioned cooling. Now, when you start this, the uh, entire, the whole equipment which gets changed has to have this cooling liquid in it. So the whole technology is put trays with liquids and uh, that's how it will cool. So this is, an, when people go in for this, they will have to upgrade the, data, the whole uh, hardware in the data centers. So it will require investment. Uh, we anticipate the percentage of this conversion will start happening, but it may not be even 20, 25% in the next two years. Hmm. Mm. Uh, Sorry, okay, 20, 25% uh, to use this technology, to use coolant yes, as a technology yes, very to cool it. So Out of the 1700 megawatts, which yeah. is the total size, it would be, all of it will not convert to this, will require large capex. So it is going okay. to be a slow, slow conversion, but uh, happy to do this because it helps the environment, reduces the operating cost. So it will depend how many data centers actually adopt this and do make you, this interesting. Do you have any uh, sort of projections for because it's a very fast growing some of the very some of the very large groups industrial groups are getting into this business data centers. Uh, I think the Adanis have got plans and others as well. Uh, you know, so rate of addition can be very, very fast from 1700 now, say over the next five, six years. Uh, at what level if you if you assume a 25 percent uh, sort of kind of threshold which will use this technology and if this is scalable, etc. Uh, at what level of data centers will this become a critical uh, sort of business, an important part of the business for you? Yeah, so 1700 megawatts as per our data is the projection for 2025, which is the okay. total data centers, uh, you know, use of power. And today, today, not even 3-4% uh, is converted to this technology, even lower. So if out of the 1700, it will be maximum you know, I would say it would be start with 3%, 5%, 10%. So it's a very niche market. And as you're rightly saying, yes, there will be expansion. So as a lubricant company, most of us are in this segment and we will be part of this growth. But I think it's still a very niche segment, according to me. But we are ready for it. We are looking at some products. It will take some time to get in because there's a lot of technology which comes in in terms of the approvals. It, it's also the DC, the data centers have to convert to this uh, CapEx for this uh, upgrade. When will you introduce the product in India? Yeah, so we are talking to people. It's it is under the stage of uh, looking at uh, you know getting the approvals, etc. Which will uh, and uh, we have the product in our global product range. No problem about that. Okay, uh, I got that. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chavla, we leave it there for now uh, because otherwise, I mean, of course, all the other businesses are doing well for you. Yes, uh, and and you've given us those uh, sort of guidance. Uh, etc. Especially on the EV side, etc. As well, you're ramping up uh, 
So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and uh, sort of, you know, running our viewers on this specific data center business, right? Because markets got very excited as they tend to do. Uh, but as you're saying, it's a very small market right now. And, uh, you know, not just for you, but for this technology. Uh, so bear that in mind. Uh, so useful conversation. Thank you very much. We'll take a quick uh, commercial break here. Uh, but I just want to sort of put, put out a reminder for you. We've got a bit budget, budget exclusive for you today at 3.30 p.m. The CNBC TV 18 CII budget town hall uh, will take place. The entire top brass of the industry body will be in attendance and we will quiz them on their expectations. Sanjeev Puri, Sanjeev Bajaj, Sunil Kant Munjal, R. Bukundan, Chandrajit Banerjee, B. Tyagarajan, Shenu Agarbal, Vinod Agarbal and many more will be speaking exclusively at the town hall. Uh, you know, for over two and a half decades now, we've been covering the union budget. Uh, and we uh, hope to keep you up to date with everything in terms of expectations, all the big views, the big newsmakers, and exclu exclusive news breaks as well. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Mitesh uh, Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani are with us with uh, what they're making of things. There's 10 minutes to go for the pre-open session. Gentlemen, good morning. Good to have both of you here. Appreciate it. Uh, Mitesh, uh, is it uh, is it going to be right back up or some consolidation perhaps uh, possible, some more consolidation? I mean, the U.S. has handed off a very, very good close. So there is that to deal with. But how would you trade? Indices first. So, Prashant, I think one, um, yesterday we took Good support around the 24, 180, 150 zone, which is where a couple of intraday modified moon averages merge, and I think that level held on. But I still don't believe that we are ready for making a, a significantly higher high. We might retest the earlier highs. So I still believe that there will be chance of consolidation. While today might be a positive day, I think till we get past 24, 420, 450, I think the market will lack a strong momentum on the upside, and therefore it will be a ranged kind of a market. Uh, idea is to trade near the lower end of the range, buy around 24, 180, 200 with a 50, 70 point stop and try to take profits around 24, 420, 450 zones. Oh. Sudarshan is also with us. Sudarshan, good morning. Uh, are you also of the view that markets will find it difficult to break out on the upside and we may spend some more time consolidating? Uh, good morning. I had that view, but today that is changing. Uh, I would assume that the markets are, we you know, for the last two, three days, the idea was on one day, don't buy, on the other day, buy on a dip. And today, I think the markets are ripe and ready for a decent up move and, and a move towards lifetime new highs. So today is a day when you want to go long in the nifty and hold on to that position, not just for intraday, but for a couple of days, say, running into next week. So my view is that we can start slow. Obviously, the markets don't rally on demand. But the chances of a new high are very strong today. I, I'm starting today. Okay, and uh, new high, chances of a new high are very much possible. The new high is 24,461 was the previous high. So you see that you know one, the Nifty can climb 150 points and higher and inch up over the next few days. What would your stock calls be, Sudarsha? Well, uh, SBI cards is a buy with a stop under 725. Crompton and Greaves Electricals is a buy with a stop under 413. I have one intraday short. Remember, these intraday shorts are simply signifying that there is some setback in momentum. They are not in essence, in essence selling, just a one-day move. So Tata Chemicals is an intraday short with a stop above 1,090. And DV's Lab is a positional buy, intraday buy, with a stop under 4580. Uh, got that, uh, Sudarshan Mitesh. Uh, what about you? Yeah. Uh, I have uh, three buys to sell, and uh, on the buying side is uh, Berger Paints. I think yesterday we saw some good reversals on the short-term charts of paint stocks. So Berger Paints is a buy with a stop at 519. Look for target of 545. A buy on MFSL with a stop at 1020 for targets of 1080. Uh, a conditional buy on Manapuram. The structure is good. Uh, wait for the stock to get past 214 half, then buy with a stop at 210 for targets of 223. And one sell call on MCX on a mild pullback around 37.35, 37.40. Sell here with a stop about 37.85 for targets of 36.20. Mm. You know, the uh, uh, Mitesh, M&M, Hero, 
these were all uh, actually both these were some of the top losers in the nifty uh, how's the, how they looking chartically so uh, uh, my sense is that i think you know uh, mnm has given some kind of a breakdown uh, on a rally i would want to definitely short it uh, anything closer to about 2800 levels because it had a big fall yesterday so i think you know not the best price to enter right now but if you get a pullback to about 2800 uh, 2795 zone i think that's an area to short with the stop at 28.35 and uh, look for a level of around 26, uh, uh, 75, 26.80 on the downside, at least to begin with. And below that, I think we could see further falls. A uh, hero, I don't have a very clear view, but even I think after a good rally has uh, started some kind of corrective. Uh, we'll leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Mitesh and Sudarshan, appreciate it uh, very much. We'll uh, talk to you soon again. We take a break. We are back with a pre-open session and later we connect with Abhishek Gaushande of Sher Khan. Uh, he's, of course, at BNP Paribas. We put the focus on the auto space and the price wars in the SUV market escalate. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Chandan Taparia, derivative and technical analyst at Motilal Oswal Financial Services is with us now. Uh, Chandan, uh, morning. Thank you for joining in. Today is the Nifty Weekly expiry. How do you expect uh, trade to pan out? Good morning, Dima and Prasant. Thanks for having me. Uh, so on the last trading session, the Nifty made a new lifetime high of 24,461. But it failed to hold the hard zone, witness a profit booking decline. But the good part is that every meaningful decline is being bought in the market. And we have the view that till Nifty holds about 24,000, buy on decline could continue for an upside move towards 24,750. But for intraday point of view, the index got stuck in between the grip of options writers. So I believe that 24,200 to 24,500 is going to be the well-defined trading range. But overall, till it holds 24,000, we can look for positional target of 24,750. If I look at the data internal, the India VIX was up by around 13% in last few days. Volatility is in, inching up because we have the event that is the budget on 23rd of July. Put call ratio fell down. So these two indicators along with lower FIS log short ratio from his recent overboard scenario indicating some sort of consolidating move in the market. But overall the trend is intact. We will be with major trend until it was 24,000. Continue with buy on decline even for intraday and even for positional point of view. Now talking about the bank nifty index, here the structure is slightly negative in short term. The banking index started to form lower highs, lower lows from last three, four days. It has been consolidating and witnessed some negative divergence so that requires some more follow-up actions. As of now, uh, it has measured support at 52,000 zone. Till the holds 52,000, it can bounce to 52,500 and higher levels, but the bulls will get the grip only above 52,000. So conditional trade, buy only above 52,500. Otherwise, it can test the support of 51,500 level. Now, looking at the stock wise, first trade is buy on Grassim. We have seen buying interest in selective cement counter. And Grassim is one of the strongest names we have noticed in the last few days. It has seen the open interest addition of around 25, 26% in the last few days with surge in the price, which clearly indicates that longs are reading in the counter. Technically, it has given a consolidation breakout of last six, seven trading session and measured trend is positive. So recommend to buy on Grassim with support of 2740. And this is token head towards 2940 level. Second trading area that is buy on Kolpa. Uh, most of the FMCG stocks are doing well from last three, four days. And Colgate has seen some short covering as open interest fell with surge in the price. Overall, we have seen a consolidation breakout and stock has been making higher tops, higher bottom on the weekly scale. And also the moving upwards from last four, five days. So expecting further breakout and the rally to us, 31.80, one can buy with support of 29.75. Last trading idea, that is power grid. We have positive on the selective power, energy, and power finance companies. Power grid is one of the strongest name. We have seen some minor long build up and expecting some short covering trigger. Higher tops, higher bottom with put writing activity also indicate up move. So one can buy with support of 336. And here we have a target till 365 zone. Okay, all right, Chandan, thanks for joining in, giving us those views with a couple of stock recommendations as well. Wishing you a good day ahead. Well, let's go back to Dipan Mehta, who's been waiting by. Dipan, I wanted your view on Sula. You know, I know it's only Thursday, but they came out with their quarterly update. 
which looked a little bit subdued, but that was because of, uh, you know, elections, a lot of dry days. The penetration, as the management always says, is Im immense, the potential. How would you view the stock at these levels? Yeah, Nigel, it's only Thursday, but uh, nonetheless, party always can start early. I'm really oh. disappointed. <laughs> I'm really disappointed with Sula. I mean, whenever you go to any function or party, there are so many people drinking wine and they have such a nice uh, repertoire of wines. And yet, you know, you have 2% type of volume growth. I just don't understand. It's not just this quarter. You go back uh, two, three quarters or since the listing, their volume growth is never in that, you know, double-digit growth rate only. I just don't understand it that, uh, you know, it's India's largest wine company. Uh, it's a brand. It's been around for decades. We all know about it. Uh, the wine consumption in the country is uh, increasing gradually, maybe rapidly in some situation, in some states. And yet, you know, the growth rates just do not come through. So I'm really perplexed as to why the growth rates do not come through. And now look at, on the other hand, I was looking at GM breweries, which makes country liquor. And you check out the numbers of that company, that's phenomenal. I mean, the, they've done exceptionally well in the June quarter. And smaller alcohol companies, be it Radico Khetan, Tilaknagar Industries, Global Spirits, they done so well as compared to, say, Sula or United Spirits or United Breweries. So that leads me to the conclusion that you need to go with more aggressive managements in the alcohol space. And the companies which I named just now, of course, we may have an uh, investment position in them. I think those will give better returns in the alcohol uh, segment. And when you're look, really looking at the FMCG side, and if you can classify these companies as FMCG, I think the company like Tilak Nagar, Globus, GM Breweries, Radico, I think offer a better potential. Mm, uh, no, uh, point taken. Deepan, uh, just a quick word on, uh, you know, uh, the life insurance companies. Is there any uh, upside here and what do you like in that space? Prashant, you've asked me before and I, I like the space a lot. It's a good defensive space. And the topic, again, usual disclosure has to be LIC. I'm very impressed with the numbers which they came out uh, in terms of uh, revenue growth rates and insurance premium growth rates. And it's a big, uh, big, big investor, one of the largest investors in the stock market. And the way the markets have zoomed up, I'm sure it's going to have a very, very positive effect on its enterprise value when they declare it for the June quarter. And it's still trading at or below around its, its enterprise value, whereas other private sector insurance companies are trading at anywhere from three to four times or so. So it's the same case that PSU banks versus uh, private sector banks and how the gap has narrowed between them. Something similar will, I mean, the valuation gap Something similar will happen in the insurance space as well. By the way, Deepan, did you hear that conversation with Gulf Oil on data centers? Yeah, I know, Prashant, you're, you're uh, <laughs> pursuing that investment theme after I've spoken to Castrol. And really, you know, I'm with you because I'm also trying to find stocks which benefit from this data center explosion, which I call it, which is going to take place. But very difficult to find anything in India right now. We looked at Rashi Peripherals, which, you know, does all this hardware for a lot of data centers. But that also, I think it's more of a trading company and they really don't have any edge when it comes to setting up data centers. So let's just wait and watch for a listing which comes through. Anantraj, of course, is one company which is very active in setting up data centers. That's, that's the only investment theme. That's the only play uh, which I can find when you want to write this particular micro investment theme. Now, my, my aim, uh, to be honest, uh, Deepan, also uh, was to kind of, you know, because it's, a, it's so much narrative in the market, right? This has happened, that will happen and, you know, uh, you just sort of attach something to something and then stocks fly. So, uh, Bull market, my, my, idea, Bull market. <laughs> so my idea was also to get them and, and, and sort of ask them really, what is the size of the market? Is it really that big? And of course, I mean, as you heard, the answer from their perspective, the data center opportunity is large, but for lubricant companies, is the opportunity large? The answer, I think, is emphatically no right now uh, because, you know, there is uh, all of that happening. But uh, take your so, point Prashant, on some of the I other companies. Say, if I may say, yeah. you have your, your entire team has a great responsibility in terms of yeah. bringing out the right news and quelling yeah. all these kind of, you know, rumors and yeah. expectations. So, doing a great job. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you what, Deepan, we'll be dwelling a little bit more into this subject uh, a little later in the show at around 9.35, 9.45 or, you know, in that uh, range. So, please tune in. Hopefully, we can get further details uh, and, uh, you know, try to address this opportunity such that our viewers get a fair idea of what's going on on that front. But thanks a lot, Deepan, for joining in. Thank Wishing you. you a good day ahead. Well, let's focus on uh, the auto space then, which has been the news this week. The price war in the SUV market has escalated. There is a green mobility push by the Uttar Pradesh government. 
To discuss this in detail on these developments, we're joined by uh, Abhishek Gaushande, the Deputy Vice President Research at Sher Khan. Hi, Abhishek. Good morning. And thanks a lot for joining in. Well, I wanted to ask you about Mahindra and Mahindra. Yesterday, clearly the street got spooked, you know, with regard to competition coming in from Maruti, the price cuts that they took as well. Street is a little bit skeptical that they have taken these price cuts. Is demand that weak? Well, they put out a clarification. But what's your view on the stock? Because yesterday, it pulled back a big deal. Uh, see, what is happening that uh, the uh, price, I don't consider it as a price cut, but a price rationalization. It generally happens during the monsoon period and the post festive season. So it has been across the segment. So uh, I think uh, uh, that should have to be taken in this way. And the company has already clarified that it was a part of its strategy. Uh, and say, for example, that uh, the company like Mahindra, Mahindra, which is a claiming that it is a uh, market uh, market leader in terms of a uh, uh, SUV revenue market share mar uh, market. So a company like that would not. Uh, uh, it's not uh, logical to think that the uh, the company for that size would um, counter the competition just by uh, reducing the price of a uh, one or two variants of its uh, leading model. So I don't uh, consider that um, uh, Kulawar or price war kind of uh, thing in the SUV on the PV se segment. Uh, in order to uh, in order to rationalize the or uh, the inventory or the move out the slow moving uh, models in some regions, uh, the OEMs used to take this kind of actions, and we are been uh, as per our dealer checks, it has been uh, across the OEM space. So uh, that's our view on that. So uh, we are also uh, in sync with the company that the price cut is not uh, uh, is not a uh, answer or countering to uh, the what is happening in the UP market. Uh, so Abhishek, is m and a buying opportunity? It's been one of the best performing stocks. It's up 60% since the start of the year. And um, since you're not too worried about what this price cut signals, um, yeah. are you bullish on m and considering the tractor demand may also improve as the year progresses? Uh, see, on the minor, minor, our view is that given that in this year the company will get uh, additional capacities and uh, uh, and it has a strong order book, say for example, uh, over 2 lakh units kind of order book it has. And industry, PV industry is expected to grow by 5 to 6 percent. In light of that, when the SUV segment is still in demand, uh, the company has a strong order book and um, uh, a strong product uh, in the market. Uh, we have a view that the uh, in the PV space, uh, Mahindra and Mahindra may uh, outperform the industry growth in this particular year. So in that sense, uh, uh, we believe that if the corrections are coming, then it's a good opportunity to accumulate the stocks like Mahindra and Mahindra. Okay. All right. Uh, Abhishek, let's talk about the other one, Maruti. You know, some kind of uh, uh, relaxation from the UP government and the stock uh went up. Now, they have clarified that this is only in the interim, only in the near term, till 2025 end. Do you think the stock ran ahead of itself, uh, you know, with that uh, 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 that small small leeway given? And the stock rallied 6-7%. UP is, I don't think, more than 10% of their mix. And I think the total hybrid is around 2% of their mix. Tell us, uh, do you think it was exaggerated or do you think there's something more in the works? See, this has to be seen as an uh, industry-specific issue. So it is not the first time that uh, uh, the government has given a kind of a, uh, incentive to the uh, to the hybrid uh, vehicles. So in 2015, when this uh, FAME 1 has been introduced, then at that point of time, these hybrids were part of the FAME uh, scheme. Later on, 2017, they have been uh, excluded. These hybrids have been excluded, and the, and the street has got impression that the government wants to promote pure EVs. So since then, um, the most of the OEMs have been trying to uh, to capture space in the EV space. That the Tata Motors has taken a lead, and Mahindra and Mahindra was also present in the EV space. So from that angle, I can say that this uh, you rightly mentioned that is an interim issue. But in all this uh, euphoria or exaggeration, uh, one thing has been missed out that uh, the uh, streets or the uh, industry's initial expectation was the reduction in the GST of um, uh, hybrid cars from 43% to 12%. It was in air some point of a time. So these two things should not have to be mixed up. 
the cut down in the GST would have a larger impact on the OEM's performance, which would because it would uh, directly reflect in the reduction in the prices and gives an autonomy to the OEMs to uh, to to introduce their models as per the the different pricing points. But uh, this particular thing is uh, in terms of interim nature. Uh, although this uh, hybrid constitutes only two percent of the overall sales, and uh, uh, I don't think there is would be a very big market in um, uh, UP. Even though if if it would happen that uh, some part of uh, demand may shift from ICs to the uh, uh, to the hybrids in the Uttar Pradesh market, Uttar Pradesh market because of this. Um, uh, Cut down the price parity between the ICs and the hybrids may have uh, narrowed down, so that may happen. But uh, again, it would be a kind of a cannibalization of a uh, product from, say, for example, demand is moving from one product to another. So overall, demand pattern would not change, or 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 I can say the overall industry estimates big would not change significantly because of uh, this particular news item. Mm. All right. Uh... Abhishek, thank you very much uh, for that. I think we are uh, well into uh, this is three minutes away from the pre-open session. Maybe just put up Tata LXC because, you know, we've been kind of talking about that one uh, from the uh, morning after the numbers uh, which came through. Stocks starting. I mean, this is, of course, the pre-open, uh, but it's starting about one and a third of a percent lower, about 100 bucks uh, down. Mitesh is with us for his 9-10 calls. Mitesh, uh, morning again. What do you have? Uh, personally, go with a buy on uh, Burjo Paints for targets of 545. Burjo Paints uh, for a, a long uh, trade here. Uh, I think the stock starting three quarters of a percent higher in the pre-open uh, session. Well, there's a new note uh, on uh, Reliance Industries. Actually, it's really on Geo and the potential public listing there and the implications for RIL. Rima, tell us more. Well, uh, Jeffrey starts off by saying that a Geo IPO is possible in calendar year 2025. Mm. Now, Reliance has two options if it wants to do an IPO. One, list it with Geo being a listed subsidiary, right? Do an IPO, but Reliance Geo stays as a listed subsidiary. And the second option is spin it off and then list it like they did with Geo Financial Services. Now, let's talk about option number one, which is Geo stays as a listed subsidiary of Reliance Industries. But here, while Reliance Industries can exert greater control on Geo, there will be a hold code discount. And the whole code discount varies between 20 to 50 percent. And that's what Jeffries has put up. Depending on where the whole code discount is, the impact on Reliance Industries. So if the whole code discount is only 10 percent, then according to them, the fair value is 3475. If you assume a higher whole code discount for, you know, Geo, then the price drops to 3257. Now, option number two is you spin it off and then list it. This is what they had done. This was the playbook for Geo Financial Services. You do a price discovery. Shareholders in Reliance Industries will receive a proportionate shareholding depending on you know, the, the shares that they hold. This will avoid a hold code discount. But Reliance's stake in Geo will fall down to 33%. And according to them, the fair value in this case, because it's better for minority shareholders, the price discovery will be 3580 So interesting note, just talking about the permutation combinations. But let's go across now to Mangalam. There is a Macquarie note on Asian paints. Mangalam? Well, yesterday, you know, we spoke about how the paint companies have gone ahead and taken price hikes. Uh, Asian Paints went ahead and, and confirmed to the exchanges as well that the price hikes have indeed been taken with effect from 22nd July. And uh, that's what Macquarie and a lot of other brokerages have also written on. Macquarie has an outperform rating on the stock with a target price of 3,800 rupees. They say that the marginal price hike that the company has been taken has come in the economy end, which is effective from July 22nd. So basically, you know, price hikes in the economy end are, uh, you know, uh, indicators of improving demand at least uh, from a mass consumption standpoint. Also, McQuarrie says that there are some signs of improvement in the first quarter when it comes to demand, but second quarter will be important to track and a clearer picture for competition mm. will emerge later. But as of now, the markets have opened. All right. Well, yeah, markets have opened and first rates are coming up. The Nifty is starting about 0.18% higher, 24,365. The Sensex is starting at about 80,053, 80,060. Uh, so the, both about 0.2% higher on the benchmark. The bank nifty is up, up a quarter percent. The mid-cap index is up a third of a percent. Uh, and uh, once again, the broader market, at least in terms of how they're opening straight up, uh, there's ma there are many more advances than uh, what is actually down at uh, this point in time. But uh, let's take it straight to stocks. And I think we've got a couple of earnings reactions to deal with first. 
Um, well, let's just start with the large cap action first. Top of the gainers list, a couple of these metal names. So, Tata Steel, Hindalco are the top two gainers. Asian Paints is the third biggest mover, 0.7% up. So, continuing with the upside momentum from yesterday, TCS is coming for some buying interest ahead of numbers. TCS opens up in the green. Uh, m and too has a green tick after the big collapse yesterday, but it's not too much. m and is just up about 0.2%, so flat, but with a positive bias. In the private sector banking space, ICICI Bank leads, um, but HDFC Bank is under pressure. So HDFC Bank is down close to about 0.3%. ITC also a bit subdued. So that's largely the large cap action. Uh, Tata LXE, a stock that we were looking at, has actually opened in the red. So that's down close to about 2%. So I guess the numbers are not exciting enough to counter the high valuations that the stock is trading at. Well, that's right, Rima. Let's see where it goes for you. From the time being, it's down close to about 2%. And as Rima pointed out earlier, it's been a relative underperformer as well. So let's see whether or not there's a recovery at some point of time. Yes, Bank, I think there was an upgrade that came about. That stock is flying away. It's up close to around 5.7%. So a big up move is what we're seeing on Yes Bank. SCI, uh, you know, Money Control had reported yesterday that probably that stake sale could finally stay, take place. You know, the government of India has been talking about that. So, SCI for the time being is up close on 5%. Yesterday as well, it popped up in trade. Ambuja Cements, well, there was a Nomura upgrade that came in there. Uh, you know, and they have increased their target price as well. They believe that the volume growth is going to be better, the capacity addition is going to be better, and they have cost levers as well. So, because of that, that stock is flying away in trade today. Zomato as well is up close to around a percent as we speak. And KCP Sugar, I think that's the one that came out with its set of numbers. That's up more than 10% as we speak. So, big up move is what we're seeing on that counter as well. Prashant. Uh, well, there's enough uh, opening with what 4 is to 1 advances to decline ratio. And uh, it's, looking, it's looking good out there in the broader market as well. Uh, so, just a few other names before we go any further. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, the ship, uh, the shipping companies, SCI and Garden, Garden Reach Shipbuilders is up about 3%. Uh, you know, and usually Cochin can't be far behind, uh, but I can't spot it for now. IIFL, you know, had uh, fallen off uh, quite a bit recently uh, from a high of about, what, 540 rupees. It had fallen yesterday to about uh, 475. It's making about a 3% comeback. Uh, IIFL has got volumes as well for this point in the day, so we'll see. Uh, KCP Sugar is up about 14%. Uh, it's got large volumes on it. Valchandagar Industries, uh, Pune-based defense uh, manufacturer, 3% higher there, 356 on that one. Talbros Auto uh, is, uh, is, is spiking once again. Uh, had a big move yesterday. It's back at about 300 and... Not back, actually. at a new high of about 390. Uh, and uh, Ambuja, etc. are also starting higher. So this is I mean, essentially what is out of the gates uh, looking very, very strong. Uh, on the downside, you've got Irda, Irkon, you know, Vedanta, which continues to be soft, about 1% about cut on Vedanta. Railtel is down about one and a third. Madison is down about 2%. Glenmark is down about one and a half. Gale is down one. Delivery is down about one. Tube Investments India is down 2%. Max Health is down one. These are all well-traded, well-owned names. Rights and CESC and MGL. MGL is down 2%. Uh, so we'll put that up as well. Tagad is down about 1%. Delta Corp, which went up about 3%. Delta Corp from the lows yesterday moved up almost 10, 15 rupees. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's starting about 1% lower. So, yeah, I mean, uh, enough happening on both sides, but uh, there's no real, I mean, we opened about 60, 70 points higher, uh, but we're there and uh, there's no real big uh, follow through uh, coming, th uh, coming uh, after that. So we'll see if uh, we actually uh, get that uh, or, uh, or no. Yeah, sorry. Samvardhan Madison is under pressure because there are reports that uh, Volkswagen is mulling the closure of its Audi plant due to low demand for electric vehicles. Mm. This has been reported in all the European, uh, you know, print and you know online publications. They're looking to restructure their Brussels site. So Samvardhan Madison Sumi is one of the um, you know suppliers to Audi and Volkswagen, and that stock is a bit subdued. But as I said, these are what reports are suggesting about what may happen to the Audi plant. If it comes through, it could be a bit of a negative. And Glenmark Life is also down close to about 2.3%. Remember, Ekta highlighted earlier that how Glenmark Pharma is looking to sell its balance 7.5% aid stake in Glenmark. Sorry, Glenmark Pharma is looking to sell its balance stake in Glenmark Life, completely exit because now Nirma has majority control. So that stock is a bit under pressure. And Kesoram too, uh, post that Q1 numbers. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll see... <clears throat> on, on, uh, in terms of follow-through on uh, many of these names as we go along. 
We have our market master of the day, Samir Arora, is founder and fund manager at Helios Capital. Uh, with us now, Samir, good morning. Great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Samir, how, how are things looking? I mean, here in India, when you talk to a lot of people, a couple of things come up. I mean, there is a lot of conversation around these, uh, these measures which have been considered on the FNO side. Uh, there is, of course, always equities taxation, which, is, which looms. Uh, but, of course, no one knows uh, what, what uh, can really happen. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's more regulatory and that, it's, it's a bit uh, anxiousness more than anything else. Uh, and that perhaps is keeping animal spirits a little subdued. Uh, what's your sense, Samir, on some of these points? Oh, no, they're not subdued in the sense the market <laughs> is up this year, 18% or something. So they are not subdued. But obviously, this is the budget month. And last month was a strong month. So it's okay for everybody, including us, to wait. But I think this tax would be a big negative if it happens. Yeah, That would show that yeah, we are getting overconfident about the world. What about the on the uh, on the FNO side? I mean, you know, some lot size increase and stuff. FNO like side. The thing is that yeah. it looks a bit justifiable because mm. although the only objection somebody can have is this is my money and how does it matter to the you? Know, why are you restricting an individual if he has the money? But you know, this is how systems and regulations work. That even if it's your money, you are guided. For example. If Singapore residents want to go to the casino, they have to pay an entry fee, which is not there for tourists. So somebody can say, I am living in Singapore, I will pay my, why do I need to pay and others don't. In everything you can see in life that it is there because if it is too blatant, too obscene, too different from the world and looks very speculative, then a little bit of checks and balance is okay. It doesn't matter that it's your money. Many states, even in India, don't allow gambling in many places. Nobody says... It's my money, why don't you let me do it? So it's okay. But the tax is different only because it stands out relative to other uh, investor, I mean, uh, other markets. And in India, we have this story that, you know, we want parity between equity and debt taxation. And that looks like a very, uh, oh, this is the reason why we should do it. But then they don't tell us how much tax is collected on STT, which is not given by the bond side. We don't know how much is the tax discussion, how much how much are we losing, how much are we gaining. So in India, this discussion is all nobody knows anything. So anything can be justified, but it is not right. Mm. Uh, Samir, uh, you know, it's always obviously, obviously hazardous to uh, call uh, uh, in the, the, the near term uh, in the market. But just just your overall sense, are we looking a little toppish here? Or, or uh, what's the overall kind of... Uh, uh, since you get so, so because, because there are this yeah. budget and all in between, and mm. you have to satisfy the expectations in many of these sectors, which it looks very difficult. That how do you satisfy somebody's expectation on how many aircraft ca carriers we'll make, and and for how many years it takes to make a carrier, and how many does India plan to make when the in China is only three or four and. I read in some Kotak report that US has only 10 or 11. So some of these expectations are so unreasonable that you have a good budget, bad budget, no budget. It is beyond normal realm of speculation. And then there is that whether we do a few small self goals only because we feel that, oh, India is the only growth country in the world and all that. Uh, so th we should just have a balance as a, as a country and as a system. Uh, because everybody is needed, FIs are needed, P is needed, FDI is needed, domestic investors are needed, but it cannot be only that, oh, because mutual fund flows are there, everything else is taken as granted. Mm. Uh, Samir, morning. Any changes in the way you're approaching India now in stocks, themes, uh, you've trimmed, added to any of your positions? Many positions we must have trimmed or added, but in the big picture sense, my net exposure, my long shot fund used to be 74, 75% going into the polls and exit poll and all that. And I want to reduce it and have reduced it quite a bit too in the uh, high 60s. Mm. Okay. And uh, where is it that you, in a big picture, where is it that you've trimmed your positions and have you reallocated part of the money? Any new interesting ideas or trends that you've observed or you're watching? So right now we have trimmed from the, the stocks which normally we don't like, but they have gone to those stages of 
70p and 65p and 80p, whatever be the growth rate. Because in the end, we think that those growth rates cannot be satisfied so easily. And at a slightest bump, you will lose 10, 15 percent. And by the way, we did lose on some of them for a few days on that June, whatever, that fourth or what was it, the day when the actual results came. And uh, most of them came back, but now we don't want to see that kind of a day again in our, at least in the short term. So you mm -hmm. can then rest of that conclude which are these they are uh, some of them are in the state-owned group and some of them are in the consumer group mm. hi samir good morning you know i was wondering whether people want to see that sort of a day again because we saw a lot of retail money coming in there and some of them are dancing to the bank you know if you compare uh, with those levels on june 4th but uh, let's focus on one of the larger names that you've been positive on hdfc bank there's been some technical news flow with regard to their msci reject there's been the fundamentals with regard to the operational update as well. And there's some chatter that maybe there could be some rejig at the top. What's your view on the current management? You, know, with you, must, to have seen, you must have seen Djokovic interview with the BBC. Huh. And he said, huh. how many times do you want to ask the same kind of questions? So I'm not answering only from your point of view, not from my point of view. Because my interviews become too boring if I keep talking about HDFC Bank and Zomato all my life. So ask me a third question and I will answer. You know, but, but I want to ask you. boring for everybody else who's watching <laughs> that as if we are a one stock wonder or a one stock portfolio. I have, you know, so I will not answer just because, just for the heck of it, because I can't keep answering on one stock on my life. I have it. Okay, so, so, so give us another one then, uh, you know, uh, if, if not HDFC, Zomato, we have spoken about that. Uh, what else? Uh, you know, what else no, are you. Djokovic quite... didn't ask BBC that I will tell you the question. I, am, <laughs> I follow them. Big boys of the world. Okay, let's talk about the pain space. You know, yesterday we got a price increase coming out of nowhere. And you have been quite positive as well on Asian pains. I think we have mentioned that as well. The stock actually has been... Two years. We are not oh, positive. Oh. And I can't speak on this because I'm interested in a different direction for one, last okay. one year. Because it was so obvious that there is so much pressure. And we had these... PMS fund managers and all who made it look like some God's gift to mankind. So the thing is now we'll see how it goes in the end, but a 0.75% hike or this is more to show to the world is as much signaling, but it doesn't mean much in real numbers. So mm. it is also in the high P average growth uh, zone. Yeah, But Samir, I cannot talk much about it. I like the I like the comparison with Djokovic. I know I, I can see where you're going. You have to benchmark <laughs> with the bench. <laughs> Let me, let me, uh, so let me circle back to the market because everything has done so well, right? So I think we, we should talk a little bit more about overall, I mean, where we are at. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, so we just had the management of Gulf Oil Lubricants. I don't know if you watched that conversation. Uh, and there was this, there was this buzz and someone sent me a one pager about the, how lubricant companies will be, they have this big new opportunities with data centers. And I got very curious. And I said, well, what is the size of data centers in India? And, you know, you got to put all those, you know, you got to cool the, and it's a real thing. Uh, and I read up, et cetera. And the, and the, and the you know, management came on. They said, well, it's, it's some 0, 0.00 something uh, percent. So there are so many narratives which are flying and stocks are up 15, 20 it's, percent it's before becoming, you can verify. That's what I'm saying. Some of this is becoming wild. Uh, if you see this, uh, as I was talking about this aircraft carrier that you have added so much market cap to these companies, and how many aircraft carriers will India make? And each, I assume, will take, I don't know, 10, 15 years to deliver. And so these profits, even if you get one order, two orders, will take 15 and 10 or 10 and 15 years. And you give them the market cap today. So most probably that cannot end well. The, the issue is that whether these stories, which are quite a few, not very few, but quite a few, if they deflate, are they enough to bring down the rest of the market? And my thinking on that is that it might slow down the returns, but it won't make it go against the world. For example, if the world is okay, then we may underperform for a few months and things like that. But it is still going to be better than what other choices you may have in India. And relative to the world also, it will be adequate, if not the number one market for the next, say, one year. But And if they increase taxes, then that will really, really make India on a post-tax basis not very different from a normal 
any other market where the taxes for most of these investors is zero we were you know these pension funds and endowments and funds based in singapore hong kong dubai which is where the money centers are and the pension funds sovereign fund endowments were anyway tax exempt then if we are outperforming on a pre tax basis by maybe say 100 200 basis points a year that means indian market goes up say 12% per annum in dollar terms and the other markets go up say 9 10% even then post tax you'll also become similar to them then what is the big story hmm. no god that although the you know, on a philosophical level the pushback to that is mark governments around the world have realized that you got to keep markets strong right because you can always so not pushback uh, you mean that it may not happen it may not happen that, that, uh, that the reason it should not happen that means that no they should increase no 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 <laughs> yeah yeah i agree no i i'm also hoping i'm only think i'm looking at the clock it's thursday yeah. 11 i think you have one or two days before these things get frozen in the budget i assume and then they go for it it'll be too late to give these interviews then better yeah. to say now that please don't do it it's not worth it you are getting yeah. a lot of money on stt get mm. stt you are not putting in that same pool and therefore we keep saying that oh the equity guys are getting lower tax relative to the bond guys or the debt guys but let me say one thing that if it comes through then in theory the biggest beneficiaries will be the banks relatively of course everything mm. might go badly those days but relatively it would mean that you are making it easier for uh, uh, for the public to not easier but you are making the two a little bit more uh, this thing in terms of tax preference and what is the interest of the government which it must be then that the asset allocation is getting influenced by tax considerations although they are not transparently uh, counting stt on the equity side and taking that as an yeah. aside and then saying the tax rate is low so actually it's not that different i think one more thing which one of uh, again this is uh, we don't know if it will happen or not this is on the debt side now everything is taxed to the uh, taxed to the marginal rate and except arbitrage yeah arbitrage uh, and that may also get corrected i don't know i mean uh, okay, that's possible but right now i don't go so deep i don't doing big picture that this is wrong to have yeah. uh, you know remove stt remove anything which is giving tax and say no but excluding that the tax is low hmm Mm. So suppose we do get some sort of a tinkering, right? Increase in holding period or increase in the amount, uh, the rate. Uh, markets will fall. Is will that fall be a buying opportunity according to you, or do you think this will really unsettle the markets for a longer period of time? The most no, uh, uh, it will fall according to me very simply yeah. about the same as the tax hike. Because let's say going in, you have a pre-tax, uh, sorry. pre budget expectation that you should make x percent return and so if you take 5% it will fall broadly similar to compensate for for the current holders then the new holders know that this is the new rate and all that and then they uh, change so i think lifelong flows will moderate as i said it's a big picture thing it doesn't mean it's bad or you will have negative returns but obviously why should new allocation come in the same day expected returns from the market instead of being 12% or 11.4% or whatever you know cut whatever how can it be i mean that means these numbers have no meaning that you can sure. whether your expected returns are 12 or expected returns are 11 it doesn't matter because the models work like that the thinking works like that and the differences are only this much it's not that 12% will become 5% return expected okay. for long term so obviously it matters when these big guys do their allocation and you can see what happened in 2018 which was after a good rally there was a tax hike of 10% effectively because the long term was zero before that and became 10 now we can keep saying it is because of covid there is that but if you see the cumulative flows of fis in india although they are good they are not of the same scale as we used to have when we were a much smaller market and i can tell you direct conversation of course these guys being you know do, don't come on tv and tell you directly but they are most bothered by the tax because there is no set off because they are tax exempt for our investors or investors in etf there is no set off they have to pay tax a second time in the us because if a guy comes into an etf for two months and goes away how to link the tax that the etf paid with that underlying guy what certificate to give him that this much tax has been deducted on your behalf 
That is why the world doesn't take tax from foreign investors, for example. But here we are not saying that there should be a different tax rate for foreign and Indian. You please change, increase SGT a little bit. It'll solve yeah. all your problems. You still get the same pool of money. You will also discourage short term. You will also discourage F and O indirectly by increasing that cost. You will get whatever amount you want. Just change the structure of how you collect it. You increase yeah. it as much as you want. I don't think any foreigner cares. It yeah. is just this. It goes into a you know like a like a basically it's gone without having any. Uh, this thing because you might book and uh, uh, like for example first quarter is good so you have accrued a tax the NAV has become like that somebody has come in somebody has gone out and then there's a fall in the market now there's no tax to be paid but somebody has redeemed at a low price high price all those things yeah. are the yeah got it no I think uh, very convincing arguments uh, Samir and I hope that you're being heard in the North Block uh, in the in that the, depends the, on whether the, they are. Watching your channel or not? They are. They are. They are. They are. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, always great speaking Nigel, with you. I just didn't want to answer the same question again. Yeah. No worries, Samir. Okay. I think uh, I've got. Uh, you know, I got the point. So uh, let's see. Uh, we'll keep HDFC Bank out, Thank but let's see. Talk. <laughs> all right, Savir, uh, thanks a lot for joining in and filling us in with all of those views. Well, let's focus on the railway sector now. Railway stocks have uh, had a strong run this year. And one such stock that's on our radar is Texmat Core Rail as well as engineering. Now, with the union budget around the corner, what are the industry expectations and how is momentum shaping up? We have uh, Sudipta Mukherjee, the managing director of the company, who joins us on the show uh, Hi, good morning, Mr. Mukherjee, and thanks a lot for joining in. Well, before we get to your budget expectations, give us a quick update. What's your order book right now? And if you could just break it up for us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, the order book, if you say it's uh, around 8,000 crore, and uh, 5,500 crore is related to the uh, freight rolling stock and balance spread over to the uh, steel castings and component and of course up to our EPC division. All right, so that's uh, not much change. The last time you joined us as well, it was around 8,000 crores odd. But you were talking about a, a large tender opening up for around 29,000 wagons. Uh, when does that happen? It's difficult for me to tell because we are sitting on the other side of the table. But mm -hmm. uh, as far as we know that it is uh, due soon, and uh, the numbers may be even more, uh, not even 29,000. Okay. What about the budget expectations then? What are the crucial numbers you're looking forward to in comparison to the last budget? Uh, expectations from an industry perspective? Look, uh, as per the interim budget, whatever be the outlay was planned, uh, which was significantly uh, in line with the expenditure which uh, railway did, so uh, we, as a stakeholder, look at it from a, a little long-term perspective rather than a year-to-year -year thing because we all have seen there is a shift uh, based on a plan in the last couple of years. So I will not be astonished if it is being increased a bit in terms of uh, as an impetus to the infrastructure. But even if it is the same, it is uh, good enough to... I mean, uh, to fructify the plan what government has uh, in the near horizon for about five to seven years' time. And I mean, it, it gives enough room for us uh, to play and to grow uh, the way we, I mean, the industry is doing in the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, sir, getting to your uh, wagons business, uh, I believe the wagon dispatch surged from 1600 in FY22 to 7,000 in FY24, and you anticipated to increase to 1,000 wagons per month. That's 12,000 in a whole year from last year's 7,000. How soon might we hit that run rate? Uh, I will not prefer to be too specific in terms of the 1,000 number because you know that it depends on the uh, various combinations of rolling stock. In Texmaco, if you see that we are the only uh, company out of uh, the existing lot, that we have the most uh, versatile portfolio and our uh, customer base expands beyond, uh, even beyond the country to all other continents. So it depends on the design and the number. But I can give you an indication that over and above whatever we have performed, 
we uh, strongly feel that we will be still able to further grow around 40 to 45 percent this year if not more okay so 40 45 percent top line growth this year right yes okay and what will export contribute because you are targeting uh, the export opportunity so we continue to uh, export freight rolling stock and of course the components of it we do uh, castings also steel castings we manufacture and we have a strong customer base in us and uh, other than that of course we do some brake frictional items uh, through one of our jv and we export to uh, america australia and all this part mm. okay all right uh well, uh, you know, there was a demerger that was announced as well. Could you give us the timelines by when do we see this uh, taking shape? So it's a process, it's in process, uh, and uh, very soon you will get to know. Uh, the companies, mm -hmm. in the, uh, I mean, uh, have complied with all the relevant requirements of it, and we have received uh, some communications also. And, uh, of course, while that goes on, and uh, I would just like to give you a picture of the thing that Texmaco is uh, even deployed and in a, in a very benefiting position. Because if you see that in the demarge, uh, proposed demarge entity, we have our portfolio for signaling, overhead electrification, track lane. Uh, so all of these are buzzwords now and government expenditure is also very high. So either way, it's not affecting, but we are only waiting for the process to get completed. But sometime, I think the last time you suggested that maybe in the middle of this fiscal year is uh, what it could, uh, you know, uh, we could see some kind of movement. Do you expect it yeah. in the second, third quarter of this year? Uh, I think, yes, it's a fair guess. Okay. And the demerged entity, uh, you know, both those two verticals together, the uh, energy, green energy, as well as rail, what could the potential turnover of both these two businesses look like? You could give it to us on a quarterly run rate or maybe on an annual run rate as well. So, uh, I would not be able to be too specific, but one thing I can uh, tell you very clearly that we have a very clear uh, vision in terms of, uh, or a clear task and a focus in terms of the existing business line and the product portfolio of the companies. If I may uh, take uh, one minute more from you. Uh, yes. So, uh, the existing businesses, if you see the freight rolling stock, uh, the component business and the uh, casting business, as well as uh, till it is demarched, the, the overhead electrification signaling and the EPC part of it, we have a clear uh, task in mind to grow these businesses uh, irrespective of the situation because if you see the customer has a long-term plan and a huge expenditure outlay is being already, I mean, consistently we can see. And with our kind of credential, uh, in as I say, in the domestic as well as in Europe or in other continents, we have the credential and we have all the certifications to catch it. So we do not want to see tidal. We want to significantly grow all these businesses uh, coming from this financial year. And of course, our focus will remain, uh, we are trying to uh, put Texmaco as a brand with a focus to uh, people, the research and innovation, and to be a technology partner, while I, technology company. While I say so, if you see in the EPC and all other segment, there are a significant uh, expenditure by the government on the safety of the railway infrastructure. So, this could be a possible avenue for uh, growth, although maybe today it is too early to comment, but to give you a figure that what will happen in the coming year or what would be the turnover, I will refrain from. But I can Got say it. that you can expect a significant uh, growth and uh, many good developments around uh, what we do. Uh, it will I mean, be exciting. Uh, point taken, sir. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee, thank you very much for joining us. It's uh, good speaking with you and get a, getting a perspective. And hope you're able to join uh, us after the budget. And uh, I think we'll have more to talk about then once we have uh, allocation numbers, etc. right? Uh, and any new announcements in that sense. So thank you very much. I just want to point out uh, a few names here in the broader market. Look at uh, BSC, Bombay Stock Exchange. It had fallen from a high of 3,500 recently to about 2,300 yesterday. Uh, it's, up, it's got a 5% move going for it, about 23.76 right now. 
Uh, and that's an interesting move because, I mean, you know, it's right in the center of everything which is happening on the regulatory front uh, in, the, in the only listed equity exchange. So that's a large move. Uh, HPL Electric, there was that 2100 crore order that we saw. It's up 12% now, 523. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty large one. HBL Power, maybe we could sort of look at as well and, and see what's uh, happening on that one. There is, of course, uh, that's about 2% pop. Uh, Zagul is another company, interesting name. 5% uh, on that one, 307 on Zagul. Uh, Atul Auto has had a, a very nice move. 5% uh, higher on Atul Auto, uh, 791. Uh, and you got, of course, this Mishra Dhatu uh, is a PSU defense name, Midhani. 532 on uh, that one, uh, going for it. And of course, all these sort of shipping uh, companies, I mean, you know, SCI and Cochin Shipyard and Garden Reach, you know, they're up. Uh, SCI is the big one with a 12%. The other two are up 4% uh, each. Uh, right now. So this is essentially the bulk of the big volume-led gainers that you have right now. Nifty itself, and this is something we said in the morning as well, it got a good start, but would you want to chase it? Uh, probably no, it's more defense, and uh, it's come off from about being 70 points higher, we're up about 10 points or so. Uh, so we are at about 24,330. We slip into, into a break, uh, and uh, we'll come right back in a bit from now. But uh, just a quick programming note uh, here. Uh, and this is the important one from a central bank perspective. Will the RBI cut rates this year? And is the RBI worried about a bubble in stock markets? Uh, and uh, is India poised for a GDP upgrade? That's uh, all of that, of course, answers to those coming up with the definitive RBI governor interview later today, right here on CNBC TV 18. Welcome back. Well, the markets are holding with very, very slim gains as we speak. The problem is the Nifty Bank that I think did see some bit of selling pressure, and that's the one that's relatively underperforming. But let's move on then. With the population of over a billion people, India generates a massive amount of data, but the capacity to store this data has been lacking, implying that most of the data generated in the country gets stored overseas. Now, with the government keen on storing domestic data in India itself for multiple reasons, and with factors like power cost in favor of setting up infrastructure, a huge opportunity is opening up for the data center space. Take a look. India generates about 20% of the global data, but has only 3% of the world's data center capacity. This means that a significant portion of India's data is stored overseas. However, this is set to change as India emerges as a significant player in the global data center market. India is attracting huge investments for data centers and here's why. Number one, capex cost for setting up a data center in India is about 45% lower versus the world average as per care edge. Second is power costs, which account for nearly 80% of operational costs for data centers. Each of our clicks from our mobiles or laptops or desktop or our smart TV is actually going into a data center. Where that data is stored, where it is getting processed, computed and stored and given back to us. 3% of the worldwide energy today is actually being consumed in a couple of thousands of buildings in the world which are data centers. And this, by the way, is a number higher than the total energy consumed by the entire airline industry of the world. And guess what? As per former power minister R.K. Singh, India has one of the lowest power tariffs in the world. Number three is the support from the Indian government. Data centers have been granted infrastructure status by the government during the union budget FY23, making it easier to access credit and secure foreign funding. Data centers and energy storage systems including dense charging infrastructure and grid-scale battery systems will be included in the harmonized list of infrastructure. This will facilitate credit availability for digital infrastructure and clean energy storage. The government's push for data localization through Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023, RBI guidelines for storage of payment system data also is a major growth driver. 
draft data center policy dated November 2020 is also another enabler. Recently, India topped major APAC countries with the highest data center capacity in the Asia-Pacific region, excluding China. According to a CBRE report, as of May 2024, India has 152 data centers with an operational capacity of 1,074 megawatt. This capacity is set to double with an additional 1,000 megawatts to come up by 2026. The per megawatt cost for setting up data center in India, which was close to 40 to 45 crores, has now risen to 60 to 70 crores per megawatt due to incremental land, equipment and other soft costs. This means an outlay of 60 to 70,000 crores would be needed to set up 1,000 megawatts, out of which 60 to 65% of the cost would be towards mechanical and electrical equipment. This opens up a huge domestic opportunity of 36 to 46,000 crores for suppliers to this ecosystem. In uh, data consumption, you have data centers where India is one of the you know hottest market uh, in the Asia Pacific region. It's the asset owners, the the, the companies which provide the land, and they uh, are the uh, they are the real estate companies which are exposed in there. And second are the companies which kind of you know provide some nuts and bolts to data centers, which could be gensets, which could be a, a power supply or some specific uh, specific type of maybe transformers and areas like that. So these are the few parts of the supply chain of the data center business which taking exposure to particularly over the next three, five years could add to good amount of maybe kind of growth or uh, you know earnings momentum uh, uh, to the portfolio. Let's look at it on a granular level. Gensets, which ensure that data centers remain operational during power failures, present an opportunity of 3,400 to 4,300 crores. Cummins India and Kirloskar oil engines are the likely beneficiaries. Motors, which are essential for operating various mechanical systems within data centers, would require 7,300 to 9,200 crores of investments, which will drive demand for products from Siemens, ABB, Crompton and Bharat Bijli. It has emerged as one of the fastest growing segments and in our assessment, I think it is going to be a multi-year, if not longer, uh, in terms of how this segment is going to play out. Switch gears, crucial for ensuring efficient and safe power distribution in data centers, presents an opportunity worth 7,700 to 9,800 crores, beneficial for manufacturers like ABB, Siemens, CG Power, Hitachi Energy and Schneider Electric. 2,100 to 2,700 crores worth of investments for transformers and GIS substations will boost order books for Schneider, Bharat Bijli, Voltamp and Transformers and Rectifiers India. HVAC systems essential for preventing overheating in data centers present an opportunity worth 7,700 to 9,750 crore. This bodes well for players like Voltas, Blue Star and Johnson Hitachi. And that's not all. There is a huge runway for growth beyond 2026 as well. Jefferies expects data center capacity to reach 17,000 megawatt by FY30. And this in turn implies a long runway for capital good companies as well. Okay, the rise of AI, the data revolution, the government push could all drive a decadal opportunity in India's domestic data center business. To talk more about it, we have Sunil Gupta, co-founder, MD, CEO at Yota Infrastructure. And we also have the analyst of Ilara with us, Harshit Kapadia. Thank you, gentlemen, both of you for joining in. Let me take off from the last point that my colleague Vamakshi left it at. Jeffries believes the data center capacity in India will hit 17,000 megawatt by FY23. Uh, so the first question is, um, you know, if you could just tell us, Mr. Gupta, what is the current size right now and how much is already in the work? 17,000 may be the opportunity, but right now the, you know, the plans are in place to hit what? By, you know, which year? So, yeah, good morning, everybody. So, Indian data center industry, which was just about 200 to 300 megawatt till about 2013-14, got a big fillip when hyperscalers came into India and suddenly all the other tailwinds like growth of e-commerce, growth of mobile penetration, uh, fiber penetration, everything started growing big time. Cloud adoption became a very, very big thing at that time. From that time to now, the current Indian data center size has already become about 1200 megawatt. Uh, it is expected to become double based on announced capacities and the capacities which are uh, under construction. 
It is expected to become about 2000 megawatt by 2027. And based on the projections uh, by 2030, this capacity is expected to become about 3000 megawatt. Now, there is a delta between this 3000 megawatt and 17,000, and that delta is coming because of the artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence push, which is coming on, uh, which is coming on the top of this 3000 megawatt, which was supposed to be based on enterprise workloads and cloud services. Mm. Uh, right, uh, Sunil, hi, morning, Harshad, morning. Uh, what is what is uh, the uh, sort of operational capacity at your company, at uh, Yota? So we have operational capacity, which is about more than 100 megawatt right now, spread across our uh, you know campuses in uh, Delhi and uh, Mumbai. And uh, the way we did it is we we sort of anticipated this uh, growth, which is going to come up in the next couple of Got years, it. for, for mm. hyperscalers or otherwise. And we yeah. had took a campus approach so that the same campus, which today possibly have 50 megawatt, can be scaled to let's say 700 megawatt in future. You know, just by keeping on adding up more data center in the same campus. So when you say, uh, so, you know, in terms of te uh, tenancy of these data centers, what is, is this, uh, when you say hyper hyperscalers, you mean uh, for cloud providers, right? Uh, yes. So, yeah. Or, or so, is it more co-location where, I mean, a company builds a data center and then kind of sort of, you know, rents out the space? Uh, it's, it's, it, uh, so in India, which segment will, uh, will, will grow and how, how do you see that uh, going? Yeah. So essentially, both the segments are growing. Uh, the way we divide as the industry, uh, uh, the, the market is uh, one is co-location and second is the cloud and managed services on the top of that. The industry which is growing very, very big in the last couple of years is co-location market where uh, you are building up large capacities, you know, and lease out the space with power and cooling and somebody else like a hyperscale cloud operator or large enterprises, or let's say GCCs, they will come and they will put their hardware and software and the, essentially the IT in your data center. Essentially, data center operators acting as co-location. However, some of the legacy players who have been operating for last uh, 20 years or so, as well as uh, my own company, Yota, we adopted a model where uh, besides giving wholesale and retail co-location, we also build our own sovereign clouds. We are delivering a whole lot of managed services and recent foray, which is uh, known uh, by Yota, is on GPUs to give uh, GPU on a, as a service model. Now that is something which is coming on the top of co-location. So in the same building, if you want to adopt that hybrid model, you can offer wholesale co-location to hyperscale cloud operators. You can give retail co-location to enterprise customers, and you can also have uh, a capacity reserve which can be used to deliver your sovereign cloud uh, uh, AI GPUs and other managed services. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Sunil. Good morning, and thanks a lot for joining in. Give us, uh, uh, you know, a couple of reference points then. The cost, I believe, to set up a data center is around 60 to 70 crores per megawatt. Would that be a, a decent number to work with? Yes. Uh, in case okay. we take data center at a co-location level, that is the right number. Right. Okay. All right. So what is then the payback period? You know, what kind of returns do you expect? And, you know, by when will it break even if you're going to be spending 60 to 70 uh, crores odd per megawatt? So essentially, it's so much depends on the fill factor also. So many times, if you're lucky, you are able to get an anchor customer even before your data center goes live. So your paybacks become as early as two and a half to three years also. But in case you are making a speculative bid and you want to have uh, you know, enterprise customers will be coming in only after the building has gone live and they'll be giving you retail business and not really a very wholesale business. The payback period can extend to four or five years. Uh, uh, on this investment around 60 to 70 crore per megawatt of IT load, the returns typically are around, uh, I, I'm talking in dollar terms, around uh, $80 to uh, $100 per kilowatt per month. So if we just do the mass, this is something which uh, can give you a reasonable return of around 12 to 18%. Mm. Uh, Harshit, uh, come in on the discussion, right? Vamakshi told us that there are many ways to play this entire boom. There are genset manufacturer transformers, capital goods. Which companies, according to you, are best placed to take advantage? Morning. Uh, so on the capital goods side, which is largely re related to do with electrical systems, we have Siemens, we have ABB. Uh, so every product has a different company to play with. So if I want to play genset, probably Cummins is the best play on the genset side, followed by Kirloskar engines. Uh, and there are some unlisted players as well. On uh, the switchgear side or substation side, we have ABB, Siemens, Schneider, but part of the Schneider is also unlisted. The listed entity is largely into medium voltage switchgears. 
uh, that's how and hitachi energy on in terms of substation related work so these are the companies that one could benefit on transformers specifically we have voltam transformers on the distribution side uh, followed by crompton abb and siemens so these are largely mncs who dominate the space uh, on the uh, gen sets uh, on the uh, data center side mm. uh, sunil you know just one uh, sort of question this so for example i was i was listening to this uh, interview uh, by the nvidia ceo jensen huang right Uh, mm -hmm. And he was talking about how their next chip, right, is uh, is 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 going to be is going to essentially replace data centers. I mean, you know, all of the processors in a data center because it's going to be so powerful. And we, when we talk a chip, we usually imagine like a small little thing. It's not. I mean, it's a big thing. It costs. Uh, he, I think he said about two hundred million dollars. But he said it is going to be so cost efficient that uh, you know it's going to over over his lifetime. you know just the co cost of copper wires in the data center will be will will be more than uh, uh, will be more than this i mean you know the ch what the chip will do for you uh, over over the life of its operation technologically is it is it are we is it all settled uh, or uh, are we will we see a revolution or is it only evolution just wanted to get a quick sense i think the market is changing dynamically right now we can clearly see that the traditional workload which were there in our professional and uh, i would say personal life till date the erps or the e-commerce applications websites email servers for majority of the use cases which we have in our life till date uh, are getting served by cpu based servers uh, before the advent of ai and more specifically generative ai now in case of generative ai you are actually training the machines with a huge amount of data so that the machine based on some algorithm uh, you know becomes artificially intelligent and start making decisions for you or start doing some creations for you my Now, my, you my uh, sunil sorry we since we have uh, uh, i'm just my question was will the will what data centers right now look at typically will they change dramatically so a lot of what is riding as as opportunity Uh, will it all be there or because the technology itself will change in terms of how you store data and you don't need these huge things uh, no, so i just yeah okay. go on in terms of the capacity it is being said by various people that whatever capacity which worldwide has been put in by data for data center for traditional loads will become at least double which means ai will present as much more capacity opportunity for data centers while in india we are talking about from 3000 megawatt to i just now heard from your program that somebody has also talked about 17000 but nobody is able to actually assess that once this huge number of gpus and a widespread adoption of ai starts happening our life what type of growth data centers will see but it is very sure that whatever capacity of data centers have been built in india or worldwide you will see at least double or triple of that capacity coming in purely because of artificial intelligence number one number two the type of data centers we are making today which are essentially on a per unit of a rack cabinet you are giving let's say 6 to 8 kilowatt of power you will end up giving 50 kilowatt 100 kilowatt or more power per rack essentially the data center will become very very dense the technology the engineering which we are using to give power to the equipment and also and more importantly to cool this equipment will change rapidly uh, just to give you an idea we are using some sort of a, a cooling called air uh, air based cooling which will basically change to a water based cooling where you are taking water right next to the chip maybe putting water right on the chip or immersing the ch uh, chip into the water itself or some sort of a liquid so that the heat can be extracted as early as possible so the data centers while as on today uh, industry worldwide is trying to retrofit the current data centers to handle these chips but the data centers of tomorrow which jensen is calling as ai factories will be very very different which will be purpose made for the purpose of handling these chips where the uh, the technology especially the cooling technologies will be very very different from what we are using today hmm uh, i got that and and uh, we're talking about coolants right is that is that is that uh, we just we had the management of gulf oil lubricants in the morning and they were telling us that right now it's very small i mean it's a new technology it's emerging but uh, but maybe it'll but you're saying it's an established technology and it's much more efficient as compared to air conditioning right that's no. uh, Uh, yeah. no. So, so, so for uh, as I said, that majority of the data center, the widespread, most commercially used technology is still uh, air uh, cool, uh, air uh, you know, air based uh, cooling. Yeah. Uh, there are new technologies which, which are emerging where you are still taking water right close to the chip, possibly sure. putting some sort of cooling plate and then doing, but you are not actually immersing the chip into yeah. the water or some sort of liquid itself. The new technology which you are talking about is where you are dipping the chip into a liquid itself. Now that technology is evolving. Uh, Uh, 
fact that people are using proofs of concept, they are doing some pilots, they are putting their CPU servers in that, but uh, uh, but NVIDIA is yet to yet to certify uh, putting in their GPU into that liquid. So uh, the, G, the the chip which is going to use the maximum amount of power and which requires most amount of cooling is yet to be certified for those liquids. But I, I what I understand from my discussions with, with various players, including NVIDIA, that uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, the certifications and and, and that uh, you know the testing work is on. Uh, my personal feeling is that that is the technology which will take over because uh, uh, you know uh, to to cool that amount of uh, heat generated by GPUs, the best way is to actually dip the chips into that liquid itself so that water can uh, the heat can be extracted right then and there. All right, uh, you know uh, a lot more questions, but no time. But so we'll, what we'll do is uh, we'll make this part one of our discussion on data centers, and we'll uh, have both of you back uh, soon again uh, to talk about this evolving new market. Not new, but uh, evolving market. Uh, Suril and Harshit, great speaking with both of you here. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Markets are up about what 35 points. Mitesh is with us with a quick trading view. Mitesh, uh, how's how things looking, and uh, what are your trades? So, uh, Prashant, I think, you know, the markets are pretty okay, uh, still sideways. Therefore, I think trading is more stock specific. Uh, SBI Life is just broken into fresh highs and insurance stocks have been doing well. So, buy here with the stop at 1550 for targets of 1610 uh, uh, to begin with. And maybe then we can see high level because this is a historical high for the stock. And the other uh, stock which I have on my list is... Uh, 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 a sell on Sun Pharma where some profit booking signs are visible. I would recommend uh, today's high as the stop loss, which is about 16 or 200 for targets or 1545. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that. By the way, HDFC Bank is a bit of a drag, and that's the reason why the Nifty and the Sensex have flattened. It opened up in the green, but now they're flat. We'll slip into a very short break on that note. We'll come back and focus on commodities with Manisha Gupta. Welcome back. So the commodity which has been shining bright is gold. Now gold has given a return of 14% since the beginning of the year and it's outpaced the equity return. But the only thing that shines brighter than gold is our birthday girl, <laughs> Manisha. Manisha, wishing you a very, very happy return you know, from the entire team. I Thank hope you, you have a wonderful day and a wonderful year ahead. Thank you and so much. And we'll see you every day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reema. So take it away with gold. Absolutely. And as you said, it's outpaced and outperformed uh, various asset classes. We are 14% up in the first half. And the second half has started on an even stronger note. We are holding around that $23.50 an ounce for some time now. $24.50 is an all-time high that the gold prices saw in the month of May. And there are various reports suggesting that you could be looking at fresh new all-time highs now in 2025. There are various supportive factors and I'll take you through them. Well, the major reason that you have seen support continuing is that the central bank buying has been quite strong and so has been the investor buying. The last two years, we've seen record buying from central banks, more than 1,000 tons per year. And this year as well, there are various reports suggesting that we will hit that 1,000 tons mark this time as well. The macroeconomic conditions are quite uneven and then there are expectations of rate cuts from various central banks, including US Fed, and that would continue to support the gold prices, which is dollar denominated, and that is where the support comes in from as well. Dollar index also trading around that 105, which is a near two-month lows, also has been supportive. This is what we've seen happen in China, where you did see the first quarter, uh, China buying at 189 tons and 137 tons in the second quarter. China actually has been buying quite strongly. And when you look at the overall gold mining globally, China buying to the tune of that is almost at around 25 to 30 percent. And that is what is expected to continue going forward as well. So strong central bank buying, China buying the most of it has been a supportive factor there. The other thing really 
really is about on where do you see the prices going on from here. And there have been various reports that have come in for the second half of this year now, reiterating that they are looking at higher gold prices going forward. So this is a report from City which says that they're looking at $2,400 to $2,600 an ounce of gold by the time this year ends. Bank of America believes that the gold prices will average around $2,200. We are trading at $2,360 right now. Deutsche Bank is talking about $2,400 as well, so we can go higher from here. JP Morgan talks about $2,300 of an average. Now, UBS talks about $2,700. Remember, we're trading at $2,350 right now, so $2,700 by mid-2025. Most of these banks also believe that there will be rate cuts. Inflation is a concern. Central bank buy will continue. And also, it's not about, just about central banks, but investors, ETFs, physical buying will also pick as we go ahead. So gold clearly, clearly in favor. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manisha, for that. Well, we'll take a quick commercial break here. Our special segment is the economy coming up next. My colleague Lada will get chatting with Amit Basole, Professor of Economics at Azim Premji Institute, to discuss the recently released uh, surprising employment data by the Reserve Bank. Stay tuned. That's coming up.